sounds loud enough, is it? Yeah, okay. Uh, we're often told that 40% of DV partner violence victims are men. This is complete rubbish. It's a headline stat, which is meaningless. Ignore it. We're not going to get anywhere with the MRA strategy peddling that. We're just going to be accused of me tooism and being ungallant, to use an old, old word. So, um, start off, just think about these very strange stats and facts about uh, partner violence. Females are much more violent partners than to same-sex others, whereas you see the way around for men, men are much more violent to same-sex others than partners. That, straight away, should very much surprise you. Cross-sex violence, as well, this is at least three times as likely female to male than male to female. Right? And in the absence of any same-sex violence, women are three times more likely to perpetrate partner violence. Right? To get a handle on the issue, forget common couple violence, you know, mutual, you need to look at unilateral partner violence. Um, and all studies, and there's been lots of meta studies on this, show that female perpetration is at least twice uh, as, as, as much as men. And um, in vignette studies, uh, hypothetical studies, um, uh, where, you, where you examine what's going on here, um, where the male is a victim, uh, women see it as less serious. They see the victim as more responsible, they're more likely to ignore the situation and attribute perpetration to males much more than to females. If you look at chronic rather than acute partner violence victims, um, only 6% of men saw the partner violence against them as a crime, compared to 39% of women. That's a six or seven fold sex differential. Now, if you look at police reports, obviously, um, three times as many reports by women than men. If you look at crime surveys, OK, it's not face-to-face. -face. Self-completion question is, it's still about 1.5 sex differential. Ordinary survey, uh, it reverses. Suddenly, it's, uh, it's, it's two, two times either way. So there's a six-fold change in the sex differential, in a relative proportion going to sex, depending just on this mode of reporting. What's called in the trade demand characteristics. We don't know how many aspects of male morality about partner violence this keys into. But it gives you a window on how completely hopeless are all these stats. The basic problem being there's no baseline. All right? So the stats are very soft. Um, nothing can be quantified. So if you look at victimisation, being a victim, um, obviously there's male underreporting. I hardly need to go into the reasons for that multiple. There's also female overreporting, and you can get a handle on that from what I've just told you about how females view uh, in, in, in vintage vignette studies. As regards perpetration, male overreporting, very likely they feel the part of violence is inappropriate, a low threshold of considering what is an act of violence, think they should have been self inhibited. On the other hand, it, it could feel shame, that could go either way. Female under-reporting the perpetration, well, yes, as well. They see the violence as not categorisable as such. Self-defence, when usually it's just, just a, it's a parrying uh, a male attempts to actually restrain her, of course. Um, and though maybe no, maybe they feel no shame either. It's a bit more complicated, but the overall, there's an overall synergy in the under-reporting and over-reporting, both of perpetration and victimisation, which all goes in the same direction. And of course, what the studies are doing here, that they're looking at self-report, but they're pairing up partners. So they're looking at the reciprocal perpetration and victimisation across partners. Um, but these are going to be, at least to some extent, independent of each other. So it's basically impossible to cross-check. I said there's no baseline. If you look at what we might call more hard stats, partner violence related, injury related rates, the problem here of course is that a combination of male upper body strength compared to female and the sex differential in body frame weakness, you see much, much weaker body frames, Louise Dixon, uh, formerly Ubain University, did a study on this and she calculated the expected sex differential and injury rates, assuming equal rates of perpetration both ways, should be 20 to 1. 20 times as much injury in females as men. The actual studies show that it's either 50-50, slightly more than women, or with serious injuries, it's actually much more men. So if you wait in terms of serious injury, uh, then it's actually... So, so the upshot of that is uh, that the effect size sort of multiplies rather than 20 to 1, it goes up to 40-50 to 1. It's off the scale 
Uh, now, in, you, you get noise in data in social sciences. Anything that's 90, 95%, that's basically a, a complete one-way phenomenon. So, uh, something very, very strange is going on here if you accept anything at all about the feminist model. And other hard stats, possibly partner homicide. You would think are hard stats, uh, but they're not. Um, uh, I mean, even the home office admit that it's you know, 30, 40% uh, male victims. A study by Davies 2010 actually calculates actually males in the majority of spousal homicide victims. But of course, the problem is most female perpetrators by proxy, lover, male friend, male relative, hired hitman, or by subterfuge, disguise poisoning contrived accident, contrived suicide. Detection's rare, prosecution very difficult. Recording often by a third party, because if a third party in the crime, he gets recorded as the perpetrator, not the woman who instigated it. So it's not a hard stat. The, the likelihood is spousal homicide is far greater by women than males, but we can't get a handle on it. So overall, there's a huge hidden effect which is being missed. We cannot quantify it. Certainly not scientifically. So we have to address the issue scientifically, looking at other strands of evidence. Right. Laboratory experimental behaviour studies, going back to these hypothetical vignette studies, you know, hypothetical situations. Uh, several studies by Catherine Cross and Anne Campbell, absolutely brilliant studies. Uh, they found that in a couple context, females actually prefer violence as their mode of aggression. Right? Males in any situation, not just couple context, any situation where a female will be a target are self-inhibited. Right? Uh, and this uh, echoes what uh, uh, a study found in 2003, which also concluded that males are self-inhibited. So there's quite a lot of evidence about this. What underpins this is also now known. This is absolutely startling. Right? Neuroscience and hormonal research. A team of investigators are looking at uh, evolutionary ancient underpinnings of violent behaviour. They found that there's an evolutionally ancient three-tier neural pathway of self, uh, male self-inhibition and physical aggression produced by close proximity to a female. It's not matched in females. It's entirely male-specific. It's standalone. There's no overlap with any other memory circuitry. It's obviously evolved for that specific purpose. Something so profound, and it's evident in insects. This is something which is deep through the phylogeny and will be up, right up through mammals, primates, and to humans. Um, for fit, the hormonal basis of female couple violence, surprisingly, is oxytocin, the, the, the very hormone that promotes uh, pair bonding. Uh, and we know there's an entirely different neurohormonal basis uh, compared to uh, of maternal, yeah, this seems to be homologous with maternal aggression, as we know in, in mammals, uh, females are fiercely uh, and fearlessly defensive uh, of their young, and we know that's got a very different neuro neurohormonal basis compared to intrasexual aggression. Evolution theorists link oxytocin with partner retention, right? So, as a description here of maternal aggression in mammals, quote, short latency attacks of high intensity, mostly directed toward the head, stroke, neck region, without the introductory threatening behaviours typically displayed by male animals. Is that not a very good description of female perpetrated partner violence, if anybody's experienced it? I certainly have. So, uh, partner violence appears then to be a, an evolution, a co-option. Uh, by evolution, of a means to retain uh, offspring, from a means to uh, retain offspring, to a means of retaining uh, the means to create offspring, i.e. your partner. It's just, this sort of co-option evolution it, is standard, and this seems a particularly simple and fairly obvious example of that. So the, sex, the difference in data according to type of couple now makes sense. Sky-high partner violence rates in lesbian couples which are in turn higher than gay couples, which in turn are also much higher than male-female couples. And the explanation of that, male-female PV, uh, that's co-opted maternal aggression by the female, uh, damped down by the corresponding male self-inhibition, right? Gay PV, well, that's rule-bound male intersexual contest, two males together. Lesbian PV is mutual co-opted maternal aggression. So you can see the quite simple there, clear explanation of why there is that, that big difference. Um, but why is partner violence like this? What's driving this? 
Uh, we, we, we know, we've got the behavioural studies, we know the neurohormonal stuff beneath it, but what actually explains it? We now have to look to biology, this is my big thing of course. Uh, you have to explain bottom-up from biology. The standard idea is that, oh, it's 50-50, we're determined half by genes, half environment. This is nonsense. Basic information theory will tell you that you know, we must have evolved to seek out in a minuscule fraction of all the possible stimuli in the environment. And we've evolved to interact, to seek those out, pick them, and utilise them. So it's genes doing that. The environment's not in pentagons in some, in some random way. Culture is biology. The reason we have the facility to have, to display, exhibit, whatever we call it, culture, is because it's evolved for the purpose, to function, to feedback, to fine-tune and reinforce the very biology that gives rise to it. It would never have evolved in the first place if it was otherwise, right? So again, the idea of social construction is scientifically dead, has been since 2000, read papers by Plomin, Toakima. It's nonsense. If you think about the brain, that's like onion layers. Each layer, again, has evolved to, to, to integrate output from layers below to feedback, again, to fine-tune and reinforce. So you have to have a, a bottom-up explanation. So um, what's the basic biological principle? And what it's, The big problem all biological systems have is dealing with accumulated gene replication error. Each time your cell divides, uh, you've got a good chance of some error. There are various mechanisms, only some of which are understood to eliminate those, but inevitably, that's why we get old. That's why I look old. You know, so I'm 62 now, I'm obviously going to die in 20 years. It's just simply accumulation uh, of gene replication error. So, to deal with that, there has to be a partition of mechanism. You need to promote reproduction. So you need to partition on one side of the lineage the mechanism to deal with that, to let the other half get on with reproduction. That is why we have males. Males are designed purely and simply to deal with this problem, to let females get on with reproduction. Right. So, um, and the main, uh, well, the main mechanism, one, one of the main, well, yes, the principal mechanism for, that males use to do this is dominance hierarchy. Males compete to form a hierarchy, which is a ranking according to genetic quality. So females keen to that, they mate with the uh, higher genetic quality males, ignore the rest, the rest take out of the local gene pool all those doddy accumulated genes, right? So obviously dominance is going to be a male intersexual phenomenon. The idea that males dominate females in a partner violence situation is obviously crazy. And we know this now because recently has been discovered an actual algorithm. We know that in all species we first sex the individual we encounter and then on the basis of that is it same sex? If it's same sex, then I'm male, dominance interaction. Same sex, I'm male, female, it's a sexual interaction. There's no possibility of a male female dominance interaction. And we now know, additionally, even more recent research, that dominance is male specific. You need the SRY gene, the biggest gene on the Y chromosome, to process what are called winner or loser effects, which is the only way you can actually construct the phenomenon of a dominance hierarchy. So we know for certain that the partner violence cannot be about male or female dominance. So what's going on? There's something within pair bonding which is driving predominantly female perpetration of partner violence. And, well, we now know what is the basis of pair bonding. We previously thought that the assumption, which feminist feminists are brought into, is it's male proprietorial control of, it's controlling females for sex, you know, the idea based on the idea that males invest. We now know males do not invest. N in no species, humans included, did pair bonding evolve so as to provision females. That's a later add-on, right? So it can't be the basis of deep-seated cognition and behaviour, right? What it is, is, is two things. Um, first of all, it's mate guarding. And, it, and by mate guarding, again, it's not control of uh, uh, the female sexuality. Its control is to try and keep the low status males away from the female. So the male's providing a service to the female to keep the low life at bay. Part, uh, part function of that is so she, she then has access reciprocally with males of still higher status than her pair bond partner so she can actually have sex for sex, pair sex with to actually maximize a reproductive output. But possibly the biggest reason is what's um, rather wordly termed um, what is it? Um, 
uh, sex differential mate value trajectory. I'll quickly explain that. Um, the problem, uh, males, obviously, you produce sperm uh, as you go on, you know, uh, in each time. Females produce eggs when they're born and they're stored. And, of course, they go off. They deteriorate, which is why uh, a prostitute can charge twice as much at age 20 as age 30. New study. Um, we do not find females anything like as attractive once they get much beyond uh, their early 20s. Right? So the way to counteract that is a female needs to nail down at her age of peak fertility, which is 18, 20, 22, a male of as high a stage as she can find to have serial offspring with. Remember, ancestrally, lactation is four years long, so it's five years birth interval, right? If you alternatively have sex promiscuously, then each child you have will be with a, likely with a male of much less genetic quality than the previous one. So your overall reproductive output in terms of quantity times quality massively goes down. So pair bonding evolved very much in the female interest. It becomes a, 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 an asexual dynamic, so the male can then say, right, I'll offer you pair bonding, but um, I want a better quality female than I can have just, just promiscuous sex with. You know, so, that, so that the male sticks out for a better quality female to pair bond with than he would have promiscuous sex with. So this explains why it is that for females, but not males, it is an absolute catastrophe to, lose your, to, to dissolve your pair bond. Right? For a male, it's a question of just cutting his losses. If his, if his partner has sex with a high status male behind his back, right, what's he faced with? Five years of not being able to reduce, and not, not only that, but being with someone who's, who's actually reproducing with the genetics of somebody else. Cut your losses, go away, find a new fair one partner. Right? The female is a catastrophe, because the, the, the next fair one she's going to find is going to be of low quality value. That's why in partnerships, so many studies showing that the main uh, the partner which controls is the female, not the male. And we know that controlling behaviour is what then precipitates partner violence. Uh, this is, to say it's earth-shattering stuff, is, uh, is an understatement. The science is rock solid on this. We should not be fitting in with the headline stats from the Home Office that just 40% of domestic violence victims are male. They're not. Uh, it's a multiple, many times. We don't know how, we can't quantify it. We, we know it must be several times as many. Basically, there is an etiology, a, a, a scientific causation, for female perpetrated uh, partner violence per se. Of course there's male perpetrated partner violence, but it's de facto. Uh, for some reason, the, their natural disinhibition has gone. Alcohol, obviously. They could be non-normal males. They could be psychopaths. They could be paranoid schizophrenics. Or it could be that the individual male are just pushed so beyond any endurance is cracked. There are obvious different reasons. So there is male perpetration, but it is de facto. Partner violence per se, as an actual evolved, biologically based, driven thing, is actually exclusively female. Thank you.